What shall we say of that greatest of all royal events, the coronation? Then indeed is the British monarchy on show to the world. Then indeed the British people let themselves go in unrestrained jubilation. For this is a matter for the heart as much as for the head, and the calculations of policy give way to a spontaneous outpouring of fervent emotion. A ride round the town to see the decorations is quite the thing to do. And it isn't only the better off West End that has decked itself out. In the Mall, and indeed all along the processional route, thousands of people are ready to camp on the footwalks so as to make sure of seeing something of the next day's pageantry. Even a soaking can't damp enthusiasm and good temper. For people to put up cheerfully with conditions like these is surely proof, if one were needed, that the monarchy is enshrined in the hearts of the people. Not much of a bed for the night. And it's up with the milk at dawn, with the rain still a-tumbling down. Those of us who have a part to play in the ceremony face an early start in the cold light of early morn. The 7,000 people with seats in Westminster Abbey must be there by 7 o'clock. Peers in their crimson velvet robes and ermine capes make their way to the places assigned to them. A heavy shower is the cause of some disarray, especially to peeresses. The Speaker of the House of Commons arrives in his 200-year-old coach. Footmen in state liveries are in attendance. Here's a judge. Here's the representative of an F territory here a Red Indian chief from British Columbia. And now all is ready for the great procession to flow through the beflagged streets between the crowded stands. The massed bands of the Brigade of Guards are a brave sight. Here come the yeomen of the guard. And now the Queen's watermen. And here's the Sovereign's escort of household cavalry preceding the coronation coach itself. Yet for all the fluttering banners, the bright uniforms, the intoxication of martial music and the roar of surging multitudes, we are not just witnessing a wonderful show. This is an event of deep spiritual significance to both the Queen and her peoples. coronation is primarily a religious ceremony, as must have been powerfully brought home to all who saw and heard what took place in Westminster Abbey. When she is anointed with the consecrated oil, when she takes into her hands the orb, the scepter, and all the other symbols of royalty, such as the sword, the bracelets, the spurs, and when homage is paid in forms prescribed by the traditions of a thousand years, her people are pledging themselves on their part to honor the sovereignty of the nation in her person and to work with her in maintaining the constitution which she has taken her oath to support. A 
solemn hush broods over the empty streets as the procession is marshalled for the return journey. As it wends its way back to the palace, the people by their chairs are confirming a pact between the Queen and her subjects that can almost be likened to a marriage, a union till death us do part. Princess Margaret's in that coach. We get a good view of her. The royal coach comes past again. The Duke of Edinburgh is nearest to us this time. Queen comes home. Directly the procession is passed, the crowd surge forward to the palace railings. There are calls for the Queen to show herself. We want the Queen, they shout. At nightfall, the illuminations blaze out, and midnight sees the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh make the last of many appearances on the floodlit balcony. And so at last, with a great display of fireworks, this memorable day comes to its close.